Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. I'd um, like to welcome our audience as well as our panelists here today. This is a, a webinar put on by the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center uh, Transportation Group with support of North Carolina DOT. Today's topic, our title is Seasoned Fleet Managers Straight Talk on Electric School Buses. Um, we're seeing no matter what you are, what kind of fleet you are, et cetera, there's pressure on electrification. No matter where you're at, you're in some phase of either, either thinking about it, dipping your toe in it, or you're, you're in and doing it right now. And today we're going to talk about school buses. Uh, there's a number of things that need to come together. And we're going to kind of go through some things. The format today is a, is a round table. We have uh, four uh, school districts or school systems here, two that we would consider rural and two that are more urban, so a little different perspective. And we're just going to, you know, get the straight talk here, here, you know, how they made the decision, what they've been doing, what's been good, what's gone not so good, or how they may do things differently if they had to start over and with some, some warnings to the folks that, that are out there, you know, thinking about it as well. And the objective here is to, you know, learn from each other and help each other along here in the process. Uh, John, next slide. Uh, like I said, format, this is going to be a roundtable discussion, so it won't be death by PowerPoint. We're just going to, going to kind of have a chat and, and hear, hear people's stories. Um, submit your questions and comments. The question panel will hold all questions to the end. We're scheduled for 90 minutes uh, from 1230 to 2. Um, our objective is to, to have our, our roundtable go about an hour and leave time for some Q&A from the audience. Uh, this session is being recorded. And it will be available afterwards on our website, and that's uh, sustainablefleetexpo.com, as well as our YouTube channel. So, you know, the intent here is to, you know, capture some of the, the good information we're going to go through here today. So, John, next slide. Um, you know, we do a, a number of things uh, to help educate the fleet community and bring people together to help each other. One of them is our webinar series. Um, we have one more left for this year. And then we do a conference uh, called the Sustainable Fleet Technology Conference, and that'll be late, late summer, early fall. We hope to announce uh, specific dates and location uh, shortly. And like I said earlier, uh, sustainablefleetexpo.com. If you just do Sustainable Fleet Technology Conference, that's where you can get a lot of information, past webinars, et cetera, on that site as well. Next. So today's host, like I said, this is the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center. I'm Rick Sapienza, and I think you can see in the in the panel above, there's uh, John Bonnets. He's with the transportation group as well. We're going to be the host here for today. And then we have our, our speakers, our fleet speakers. And I'll let John go ahead and introduce the fleet speakers. He's more familiar with our, our group today. Yeah, thank you so much, Rick. <clears throat> so I'm John Bonnets with the Clean Energy Technology Center, and I'll be uh, kind of guiding the conversation today with our panelists. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Donnie Owl, who is with the Cherokee Boys Club. Uh, Donnie is the service manager and the vice president of the Cherokee Boys Club. Uh, the CBC is the uh, fleet and transportation service provider for all of the schools in the eastern band of Cherokee Kuala Boundary and uh, so he's got quite a lot of experience with a number of different buses but they also have um, transit and charter buses and they do maintenance on other vehicles even from surrounding school districts. Wendy Anderson is transportation director with the Randolph County Public Schools and Wendy uh, came to that role through as I recall um, a similar work with DOT. Is that right, Wendy? That's correct. Yep. Um, and Paul DeAndrade is the Assistant Director of Transportation with Fairfax County Public Schools. And Fairfax has got quite a lot of experience, uh, a similar amount of months of experience as, as uh, the Cherokee uh, with these electric school buses. And uh, lastly, Hope Watts is Transportation Director for the Lynchburg County, excuse me, Lynchburg City Schools. And uh, Hope, you come from a background 
uh, in the military, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. I was in the Marine Corps for four years and then a um, civilian contractor for five years after that. Doing the same job, just got to look like a girl and go home at four o'clock, which is pretty great. So we've got a wonderful set of diverse experiences and backgrounds, and uh, we're very pleased that our panelists have uh, arranged their schedules to be with us today and to share their knowledge. Um, so I'd like to just kick us right off and, and ask um, Donna, if you would please start, uh, if you'd briefly describe your school district, how many students you have, how many are transported daily, how big is your district territory, and how many diesel buses are in your fleet and how many electric school buses? Uh, we have 26 buses, six of them are EVs. Um, we haul around 1,500 kids every day. Um, I've got the EV buses on different routes, one the longest route and then a, just a regular normal route. So. Uh, the longest route we run is around 55 mile round trip and the EVs are going real good with it. Okay, thank you. Wendy, would you help us understand the character of your district? Uh, sure, Randolph County is a primarily a rural county. Uh, we're about 790 square miles. Uh, we're the 11th largest county um, in the state of North Carolina. Roughly 15,000 kids, we transport pretty much half of those kids. Uh, my fleet is about 164 buses, all diesel except for one. We have one electric bus. And Paul. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're Fairfax County, Virginia. It's a sub suburb right outside of Washington, D.C. It's the largest school district in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, we transport 147,000 students on a daily basis. Uh, we're approximately about 406 square miles. Um, our total buses in our fleet are 1,625. 28 of those are electric. And we have uh, we're approximately 900 vehicles that we're responsible for in our white fleet, which will consist of cars, trucks, and so forth. Six of them are EVs. And who? Uh, we're Lynchburg City Schools in Lynchburg, Virginia, and we are the smallest by far. We only have about 8,000 students in the district, and we transport just shy of 6,000 every day. Uh, the city of Lynchburg is only 52 square miles, so we're not real big. Uh, we have about 60 buses on the road every day um, with about 475 different runs. Uh, we have 108 yellow buses. I'd like to get that number down to 90 because Lord knows we'll never have 80 drivers at one time ever again. Um, mm -hmm. Currently, we have one electric bus, and we have, we're expecting 24 more after the first of the year. Excellent. <clears throat> and then I'd like to also run around the table and, and ask each of you to share a little bit about your personal journeys. Uh, and how you got to the position that you're in currently uh, growing your fleet of innovative electric school buses. Donnie, how did you get into this line of work? Uh, it was like a collaboration with the tribe and us, and we went out and uh, rode on an electric bus and went to some uh, shows on and stuff, and Katie tigered it with us to help write the grants and stuff. We just wrote the grant and got our first bus through the VW program. And it's just went on from there. But I recall you've got uh, 27, 37 years of uh, maintenance experience. Yes, I worked for Ford for 20 years and then moved up here. I've got 17 here. So uh, that's all I've ever done is Automotive. Yep. I've been joking to people that you've got diesel in, in your blood. <laughs> it flows and, we, well. and and when we first met, I think it was your um, you were learning about how to make biodiesel from waste fryer grease about a decade ago. 
Yeah, all of our buses, all of our diesel buses are owned by a uh, 8020 blend. Um, and we make it here on site. Uh, we get all the oil and stuff from the restaurants and stuff. And they're still doing it today. And Wendy, there in Randolph County, how did you get into this line of work and how do you reckon you ended up where you are? I was a high school chemistry and physics teacher and then I slid over to DMV and uh, was working with the school bus and traffic safety section. Um, parts always belong to Randolph County and then uh, took the job as transportation director. Uh, Department of Public Instruction reached out to us when the EPA grants first came around and asked us if we would be interested in an electric bus and I said no and um, actually asked us a couple of times and I kept saying no. And finally, uh, Randolph Electric Co-op approached us and asked if, if they would be willing to do the uh, chargers for us, would we entertain the idea of getting an electric bus? And I said, yeah. And so we have it now and um, things are going great. That's helpful, thank you. Paul, tell us a little bit about your background. So I started off actually on the, ma the mass transit side of the house. Um, I started as a train driver um, in New York City um, over 25 years ago. And I started working up the ranks in within the mass transit sector. And I'm relatively new to school bus. Um, I've only been in school bus for about three years um, when I left Metro in DC and then came to Fairfax County Public Schools. And, you know, during that time, you know, pivoting through COVID and everything else, you know, we had opportunities to kind of jump into electrifying our fleet and it's really just jumping head first into it. You know, we had a partnership with Dominion Energy that provided, uh, you know, funding and charging infrastructure for our first eight buses. So, yeah. Oh. Well, I always say that my love of logistics came from me being from a long line of truck drivers and having a train track in the backyard, but I've always loved it. Like I said, I started off my career um, in the Marine Corps with uh, logistics. I've been doing shipping my whole career. Um, I moved over to, um, public transit like Paul did, um, worked at public transit. I was the AGM for Lynchburg's um, public transit system for about two years until I saw this position available with Lynchburg City Schools and figured I'd throw my hat in the ring and here I am. And uh, when I was in college, um, I found out I was very passionate about green logistics and I try to put sustainability at the forefront of what we do here. Great, thank you. So the next question is about your initial skepticism, each of you, and Wendy, you've been candid with us about your skepticism. So uh, Donnie, can you tell us about your initial reservations about these electric school buses and what changed your mind? Uh, first, first two things I thought about was power and uh, how they're gonna do here in the mountains and uh, how long is the battery gonna last? And, once we went out and rode on the bus and I seen the power that it had and all that good stuff and I kind of moved to changing my mind a little bit. I mean, first thing with no, it's not going to last that long battery wise, but uh, they have really impressed me on how long the battery will last. And that's how we got started. I remember you told me that you had you had a whole bunch of questions and you gave those to Thomas Built and they'd answered every single one of them and then you came up with some more and they even answered those and eventually you decided you just better try it. Yeah, we we actually went to Asheville and wrote on one and that's where I was asking all the questions and getting the answers and, and it worked out real good. Paul, did you have any initial reservations going into this? So some of our initial concerns was just the scope. Um, when you have a large bus fleet, you know, switching over from 
one source of fuel to another source of fuel is, is a huge task. So just being able to make sure we're able to support some of our longer routes. And we also have drivers that do midday shuttles and things of that nature. So when are we going to have time to recharge and being able to have provide reliable service? So those are the initial things. The battery, how long it's going to take? Are we able to be able to support all our runs? And also how we're going to plan to support changing 1,600, 1600 uh, buses. Mm -hmm. How about you? Did you have any concerns going into this? A little bit. I wanted to make sure the technology was there, that um, we weren't buying into something that five years from now is going to break down and not be sustainable like we want it to be. And I remember looking into the technology when I was with public transit and um, we're very leery about it on that side of the house because your buses are on the road for 12 hours a day or more. I think we actually ran 16 hours a day. And um, so when I came over to the school buses, it is much more ideally suited for electrification. Um, so that's what I really started to heavily pursue it. So, the next set of questions is about uh, practicalities and, and logistics. Uh, <clears throat> for our audience of, of fellow fleet managers and transportation directors who are considering a shift, can you walk us through a typical day managing the electric buses compared to the diesel ones, Donnie? Um, just making sure the chargers are charging and uh, make sure the batteries are up for the run. Um, with us here, our buses will do both runs on one charge, uh, even on our long run. So as long as they're charged that morning, we're good to go till the end of the day. They'll get, um, we'll make sure that they're hooked up and charging before we leave. And what are some of the initial challenges that you faced during this transition? And how have you overcome them? Uh, the main thing is really charging your infrastructure, um, making sure that it gets done and uh, everybody is on the same wavelength when you're doing your infrastructure is the main thing. Okay. Wendy, how about you? Um, I would echo what Donnie said, but I would add with it, you have to think through the logistics of getting the thing charged. Um, is the bus driver going to plug it in? Or are you going to have the fuel guy go by and plug it in? Um, where are you going to park it? It's got to be out of the way, um, but you still need to be able to get to it. Are you going to put it somewhere that the teachers are going to come in and park in front of the charger and then you can't get the bus in there? And um, there's a lot of logistical concerns with that. Um, and also the mechanics. Um, you know, the guy's got to be able to work on it. Uh, what do we do? We know what to do when this light comes on or that light comes on, and and um, those types. Those were our major concerns. Um, the logistical side of it, as well as the mechanical side of it. What do we do if? Um, and we've worked through those pretty well, I think. Paul, what would you have to share about practicalities and logistics on a daily basis? I definitely echo a lot of the concerns that the panelists have shared, especially around making sure that they're charged, the buses are charged every day. Um, if we go out for our AM runs, our buses are coming back about 20% charge left, about 20, 30% charge left. So it's imperative that we get full charges overnight and we're able to get a full charge during our midday. So just making sure that each bus gets fully charged is, is a task. Uh, making sure that we're continuing communicating with with our vendors, with the utility companies, just making sure that we give us an opportunity to be fully charged. And like I said, it's a learning curve and learning what the different faults mean. Learning if what happens when the bus goes underneath 20 percent, you know, if, if there's some software uh, glitches that may uh, prevent you from charging. So we, we have to be really cognizant of all the little things, but we've had ex exceptional support from, from our team and, and we're working through them all. Mm -hmm. Well, as you mentioned, you know, state of charge and concern with charging, do you folks have telematics where you 
real time can see state in charge of your bus? I do. Yeah, we do. We don't have it on site file managers, but um, Dominion our utility they could see it, but we we don't have the full telematics where we could see it. No, it would be helpful. So, so with the Dominion system, you're, you're, it's, the bus has to be plugged in to, to understand state of charge. Is that correct? It's through the network? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. All right. Sorry to take us off track a little bit. I, I, I wanted to stick on that one a little bit. Well, so. That's a great question. Wendy, you, you indicated you've got telematics. Yes. Uh, great. We know when she's charged, when she's not charged. I uh, get a little notification on my phone. We have any problems, we just call the electric company. Or Thomas Bus, whoever who you know, who wherever the problem's at. That was one of the deals with us. We didn't want anything that was gonna work us to death. We're not big enough for that. Um, so we couldn't take on anything that was gonna um create so much extra work that we couldn't maintain it. And uh that was part of it. And it's we hadn't had any issues. We had one time where the charger went down and it was fixed within a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Paul, you mentioned learning curve, and the next question is actually it's a couple of questions. Uh, is I'd like to focus on um, the, the two fleets that uh, have uh, the greater months of experience, almost two years of experience now. Uh, Donnie and Paul, um, given your hands-on experience, what advice would you give to mechanics transitioning from diesel to electric bus maintenance? Right. So the first thing is going to be training. Uh, you just want to make sure that the bus vendor that you use um, provides adequate training for your mechanics. It's going to be something new for them. And you want to make sure that they have the support. Um, the second bit of just really seeing how they're adapting their skills from diesel to electric buses. We don't, we, we partner out our um, we, our mechanics. Um, it's not in-house, the actual county do, does our mechanical work, but um, definitely it's running smoothly. But a lot of it is because, you know, Thomas Buzz, you know, Sonny Merriman, they're providing the training and they're helping them out and they're helping them diagnose any issues. Yep, same with me. Okay. Just uh training is a main thing uh you're dealing with high voltage uh, make sure the mechanics know what to turn off and everything to uh so they don't get killed um and thomas bus is a big help with any issue that you have um uh, we we usually take care of anything that we need, but electric wise, we've not really had any problems. And the buses themselves are basically the same as a diesel bus, uh, more or less. A um, few little different things, but um, they've done real good. Yeah, Donnie, tell us about the AC. <laughs> Uh, that's really the only thing that we've had is keeping free on in the AC system. Uh, uh, just finding the leaks and taking care of it. What was striking to me is that that's a consistent problem with, with each of the units that you have, and yet Wendy has uh, a success, a bill. A, a bus that was built after yours and that she hasn't had that problem. Right. Um, it was also striking to me that that air conditioning system, of course, is separate from the drivetrain. And, and so um, you can still keep the buses rolling, but is that right? Yes. Still keep them rolling, but they uh, raise a little cane when they get a little hot. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Okay. So another set of questions is about the economic considerations. <clears throat> From a cost perspective, how do the operating costs of these buses compare to traditional diesel buses over time? I'll just let anybody volunteer on that. 
Well, what With? I yeah, what I think as far as uh, basically charging versus diesel, uh, it's actually cut us about in half on fuel cost and what it's been costing to charge. Uh, it's been about eight hundred dollars a month, and it's costing us four hundred dollars to charge. So that's one of the big factors. And, and same here, we're seeing a significant, you know, um, savings when it comes down to fueling uh, between, you know, charging versus uh, diesel. And also for maintenance, um, you know, less parts to change, things of nature. Of course, the bus is under warranty, but, you know, you're definitely seeing less moving parts to change. And you should see a lot less brake wire because the buses hold back so well with the regenerative. Uh, I don't see us changing brakes for a long time. Donnie, how is being a certified maintenance facility for a major bus maker influenced your experience and your transition? It helps a lot because we can uh, take care of the stuff here and under warranty and put in a claim to Thomas and where we're a satellite dealer for them. Uh, it makes a big difference on what we get. Okay. The next question is uh, about uh, community and environmental impact. Uh, I'd like to hear from each of you if you have something to share on on um, just tell us a little bit about the impact that the switch to electric buses has had on your local community and the environment. How have students uh, and parents responded to the transition? We've had a real good response when we got our first bus. Uh, we actually uh, at the school they taught I think it was fifth graders about electric and how it takes care of the air and, um, and then the fifth graders went and taught kindergartners about it and then we had a big show with the governor and everything and we took the kids to that show with us on the bus and it turned out to be a real good the kids done a show for them and danced and everything so it turned out real good uh, the community is really uh, helping us out. Nothing, nothing bad. Um, same here. Um, excitement. Uh, one of the things that students have said, riding the electric bus, they don't have to scream anymore. So they could actually do some of their homework and have a little more quiet time. As you know, from just driving the school bus and, you know, hearing the diesel, you got to talk over the diesel. So definitely have some excitement on that level. Uh, you know, from the drivers, they love it also. You know, the first thing, I don't have to breathe in diesel fumes. You know, it's much cleaner. It's much quieter, you know. And, and so everyone's excited. Everybody wants more, you know, in, including, you know, the public and the students and, and our drivers itself. So it, it's been well received. Yes, I mean, you can actually hear the kids talk about you now. <laughs> well, how, how, the, how the drivers responded to it in terms of, you know, coming out of a diesel bus and, and driving electric? Well, we had to, uh, quite a few drivers that didn't want to have anything to do with them when we first got them and didn't even want to get on. And then they drove it one time and now that's the first thing they go to. Uh, right. Here. We had a lot of pushback from drivers saying, I'm not getting on that thing. I don't want any part of it. And then I've made them drive them and exact same thing. They just fall in love with it. Now they fight over who gets to get one when they, when we have all of them come in. So they love them once they that, get on and drive them one time. That, that's a big thing. Get them the experience instead of the preconceived you know, notion or conception they have or the myth, the myth they've heard. You know, the hands-on really helps. Um, you know, Donnie, Donnie went out before they even did them. And he said he, he rode somebody else's buses and that kind of pushed him off the edge. 
that's good. And then, you know, in terms of the drivers, it is different driving a diesel versus electric. You know, Donnie talked about the regen and not not expecting to replace brakes. I mean, did you guys do some training with your drivers? And and I hope you did because we've had experiences where you didn't, and they were driving like a diesel, hard on the gas, hard on the brake, and the range doesn't do very well when you drive them that way. Right. I'd like to throw another perspective in here. Randolph County was not as well received. Um, we got pushed back. You know, we are a country county. We know how to work on tractors. Uh, we are diesel people. And so we did get pushed back from the community, um, from drivers, from parents. Um, are we going to electrocute the kids when we pick them up in the rain? Um, you know, the thing looks like a sewing machine, uh, on and on and on. And so we've had to do... Um, quite a bit of work on the ground. Um, we've had the local community college come over with their kids. We've had this bus at every kind of public event we could have that uh, for people to see and for them to hear it or not hear it uh, whenever we crank it up. Um, and it, it's better, uh, but there's still a lot of skepticism about it. Um, you know, the common question is, well, is it, is it still running? How many times have you had to go get it? Um, and yes, it's running and we haven't had to go get it at all. Um, but there was some pushback on it. it. It's not been all, I mean, nobody's been ugly about it, but um, it, it, I don't know that we necessarily had the same response that, that the other three did. And we kind of knew that going in. Um, one of the reasons that we took the bus was because we wanted to have a say. Uh, we're a medium-sized county and we're a very rural county. And we didn't want it to get handed down to us and told how to do it. We wanted to step up here and try this and and, and have some input and some say in, into how these things work into a fleet like ours. Um, because we are, I mean, we'll go 10, 15 miles before we pick up a kid. Um, so we have long, long routes and not necessarily a lot of kids. And so um, that that's something that you have to, you really need to know your community, um, what you're going to get. Well, that, you know, now you're a good handful of months into it. Uh, the people warmed up to it, and you've seen, you've demonstrated safety. You haven't electrocuted anybody, and and that's a big thing. These are safe vehicles. Yes. You know, there's redundancy yes. in them. Um, you are not you're not going to get electrocuted. Right, right. Unless you, but they didn't know. Yeah. yeah. So. So that's interesting, Wendy. I appreciate you sharing that, and I'm curious. You say that you did anticipate that, but uh, did you anticipate the level to which it might require staff involvement or your involvement in actually doing that those public outreach events yes um that bus sat in my garage for a while before it ever left here because my folks needed to be comfortable with it we needed to own it we needed it to become who we were because it was going to represent us and here again we work on tractors you know we know diesel inside out but this was not something that we knew um, this was something that we had to learn, and um, so yeah, we knew. Um, we knew it. It wasn't surprising. Um, it just it, but and it, it's okay. It's okay. Um, people, everybody's scared of change. You stole words right out of my mouth, I and mean, it's it's changed. So you need to prepare them. You need to educate them. Get them comfortable. And once they're comfortable, they forget the old way. You're this is wonderful. We like what you're doing. I think it's really important not to shove it down people's throats. You have to talk people through it. Mm -hmm. um, that that was a big thing for us, you know, with, with my mechanics. Um, I've got about 20 mechanics that work on all these buses, and that was important. Yeah, all right, guys, here's what we've got. This is, all right, we can do this. You know, all right, if it don't work, we'll take the diesel wrecker and go get it. But, yeah, we can do this. And that I think that's important. You've got to have buy-in. Otherwise... If you don't have buy-in from your your folks, it will not work. No. Hope, did you have something to share? Uh, no, just the same thing that um, you know, just that pushback. Lynchburg, we didn't really get a lot of um, feedback. Period about it from our teachers, students. They're just kind of huh, whatever. Who cares? Um, but we also haven't done a major push. We're kind of quietly bringing our, um, our first bus on board. And we're using that mainly to train our staff, train our mechanics, train all of our drivers one by one to make sure they're comfortable and confident before we get the rest of them in. Cause we'll be at almost 50% electric um, by the end of this school year. 
uh, that that's a major change. And like Wendy said, everybody's afraid of change. Um, so we're really taking our time with this one to make sure that all of our staff, especially, is comfortable with it. Because Lynchburg, like I said, we haven't really gotten we haven't gotten anything either way, positive or negative, about moving to electric from the community. Um, Hope, you had uh, mentioned the challenge of keeping drivers. And uh, Paul, you've got such a very large fleet. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Do you see or have you already seen <clears throat> some benefit of having electric vehicles in terms of recruiting or retaining drivers? Um, the, the, nothing tangible, to be honest with you. Um, the drivers that have it love it. The only thing, like I said, some of our capabilities with our long routes, our routes are really long. So when you have drivers that do a lot of middays and a lot of shuttles, you know, during the middle of the days to make additional funds, or additional money, additional hours, you know, they shy away from the electric buses because they're not going to have the capability. So I can charge all once to say, and then I have to worry about it for the rest of the day. So those are the challenges that we have with it. But outside of that, if it was the drivers that just do their set of AM bells and then do their set of PM bells, they love it. No problems whatsoever is when I want to sign up for the field trip and I feel my bus is limiting everything else. That's where we have those those issues. But but other than that, it it is it, good for those who, who has it, but the people who shy away from it is usually because I can't make enough money. Yeah, that that's an interesting wrinkle, and that's also something that I think as the battery densities improve, as the chemistries improve, uh, as the ranges get longer in the average bus uh, that will also evolve, I reckon. Hope, did you wanna to respond to that question? Um, Lynchburg is very well designed for electric buses. All of our fleet comes back to one central location um, every day, um, both night and during the day. So even those drivers that do have the middays and are out longer, they do have the opportunity to come back and swap their bus out. So if they want to take an electric for their morning run and then come back, let that one charge and take a diesel bus out for their midday, they're welcome to do that. Um, of course, we can't send them out on field trips or to ball games yet, just because we don't have that that range yet. But I, I foresee within the next five to 10 years, we'll have charging stations at, at all the schools and um, ball fields for away teams to charge while the game's going. I just see that as something in our future. Yep. I'd like to take a moment to pause to make sure that our audience is aware that we're receiving questions through the, the question panel. Uh, so please feel free to type in your questions or let us know if you'd like us to call on you when we reach that point uh, after we've gotten through the prepared questions. Um, the next question for the panelists is about your future plans and aspirations. And I'd like to go through each of you because you've got each unique stories to tell. Um, so what are your plans for converting more of your fleet to electric? And what do you see as the biggest hurdles to overcome? Donnie? Um, we have applied, like I said, we have 26 buses. Um, we have applied on the EPA grant for 15 more. Uh, we've not been informed yet if we've got the grant. Um, we're shooting for a complete fleet of electric. Um, also working on solar panels to uh, back up our charging. Um, maybe a microgrid. I'm talking about that too, but um it's just a matter of grants and availability and uh how it turns out in the future so okay wendy um right now this second we're gonna hold what we got uh we're not opposed um we tell folks we're the perfect pilot because we're just gonna figure out if this thing works or not um it we're a little different in that we have 31 schools and I have buses parked at every school. I don't have buses parked in a central location. So if we're gonna 
uh, put more out there, that means we've got to have chargers on school grounds. Mm -hmm. um, and the one I've got has a charger on school grounds. Um, but we've just got to see how, how this goes first. We're like not opposed. But as of right now, this second, we have not applied for anything else. Thank you. Paul. Um, we're looking at multiple grants. Um, we've been directed by our school board to be fully uh, electric fleet by 2035. Wow. So we are looking at funding. We're looking at partnerships. Um, through utilities, and we're also looking at, you know, realistically creating a budget to purchase 50, 60, 70 buses a year in order to make that goal uh, and retire our diesel fleet. Um, same thing, you know, we're partnering with our facilities folks with looking at microgrid solar panels, tying it into the schools. Um, similar to Wendy, we have buses parked at schools. We do have some central locations, but we have buses parked all over the county. So we have to kind of look at, okay, one, we have our yards where we have about 100 buses each, and we'll be able to kind of easily segment those, those yards, but going into the schools, working in how are we going to, where they're going to go, when are, those, when are they going to be updated with their current uh, capital improvement plans and trying to get in on those capital improvement plans to, to get it when the schools are renovated to create those spaces and to create those microgrids and everything that we'll need to support, you know, a, a net zero, you know, buildings and, and school system. And hope. Um, our goal is to be 50% electric by 2026 and 50% of our in-service fleet um, because we have such a high number of, um, of spares that I'm only focusing on the in-service fleet. But with the 25 coming this spring, um, that'll put us close. And then we have, we've applied for four in this next round of EPA grant funding. And we plan to apply for three more for the following one that closes at the end of January. Um, so if we get those that'll put us over half if we don't get those we're still very close to 50 percent and i plan on staying at 50 percent for at least the next eight to ten years mainly for um, replacement purposes we are uh, it's gonna be difficult to replace 25 all in one year so we're going to stretch that out so that um, our replacement value isn't all at one time well, that, that could be very beneficial that you have such a large number of uh, backup buses uh, in that those for certain grants, you can sacrifice those as uh, replacements. Absolutely. Um, as Donnie, uh, Donnie Al did with the uh, DERA grant, D-E-R-A, uh, does require the destruction of those buses um, and then uh, scrapping or salvaging. but. Um, that may be may put you in a, a beneficial situation. So I tried to jump in. I mean, we've had grant funding mentioned a handful of times in the last few minutes, and I'd like to just ask folks, you know, how how are you funding these buses? We know they're definitely with a charger and a bus, it's more expensive than a, a conventional bus or even some of the other alternative fuels. You know, wh where are you finding your funding? I, I know there's a lot of money out there, both on a state and federal level, but you know, how are you doing this? Yeah, Donnie, you've got a, a several different sources. Yeah, we have uh, just like we did the DARE grant. Uh, we have went and asked for money from the tribe. Uh, we have what they call the Preservation Foundation. We went and applied there. That's where we got our solar panels and stuff. And it's just different things and just looking it up and finding it, basically. Yeah, and being resourceful. Yeah, I count the Volkswagen settlement funding for the first bus that you got, and right. the UPA DIRA, um, but you believe so strongly in this that uh, uh, the Cherokee Boys Club itself funded a bus. Is that right? Yes, please. we actually bought one. Uh, with our money, no grants or nothing, and the other five was all grants. I guess, it, and, has anybody done some estimate on TCO 
for a, jet, a business case justification. Because that's the thing we've seen with other all fuels and other vehicles that they say, hey, you know, this is over the life of the vehicle going to cost us less maintenance, um, operation, et cetera. And it's, you know, we, we saw it with propane with Mesa, Arizona. Uh, and they, they saved the equivalent of the replacement cost of a conventional bus switching to propane buses over the life of the bus. And that, you know, the city council stepped in and funded them. Um, that's a potential there. In terms of looking for funding, I mean, depending on what state you're in, seek your clean cities. They have their finger on a pulse of, of funding. Um, you know, we're just, we're mentioning stuff here. Don't, don't, you know, feel around in the dark. There are folks that understand these programs. So, you know, take advantage of the resources that are out there and available to you. You know, our group's one of the groups that, that understand North Carolina and some of the federal stuff as well. So that's a little bit of my point, but I was just curious where people are getting the money for these buses. And it sounds like several sources, VW, here, you've gotten some you know, locally as well. Yeah, Paul, would you remind us of the sources you've used? Yeah, so our first eight bus, buses came from a partnership, a grant from uh, Dominion Energy. Uh, we received 10 buses from the first round of the Volkswagen DEQ grant and uh, a second 10 from the second uh, uh, funding opportunity for the DEQ grant. And uh, we purchased three buses on our own. Um, we're, we should get those by the end of the year, by the end of um, the school year. Uh, so we're also looking for a lot of different grants. I think initially with a lot of the EPA grants initially, um, because we're such a big county, we didn't qualify. <laughs> so so we're, we're putting it there and we have the same budgetary constraints as, as smaller counties also. And it's something that we express back to the EPA and giving them feedback you know just saying that you know we would like more opportunity to be more considered um so but we're, we're definitely the same thing you know we're partnering with with sunny merriman which is our bus vendors and dominion to see what opportunities there you know there's third party advocacy groups you know like wri that that has information out there that's going to help you out and the same thing clean cities we have virginia clean cities and and greater washington uh Clean, clean cities that, that are also there for resources, not only just walking you through the applications, but just actually helping you start to, in that space where you guys may be, where do I start? How do I start? You know, there's some people out there that help, including, including people that's been down the road already. Well, well Paul, you mentioned it a little too big. I, I do want to point out that some of the rural folks don't be bashful there's a carve out called Justice 40 in the government programs, earmarked specifically for rural and underserved areas. So there's, there's money set aside and it's quite a bit of money. Um, so if, if you're interested, go for it. Don't, don't, like I said, don't be bashful. I think that's a really good point to make, Rick, and I'll, I'll hammer it as well, that the EPAs, uh, both their competitive grant opportunity and the lottery rebate, which is the rebate is available for applications right now through Jan January 30th. Um, both of those programs prioritize lower funded or l low resourced or impoverished communities and rural communities. And uh, moreover, um, environmental justice is, is a component in their prioritization. So uh, <clears throat> It's definitely worth looking into if you feel like there's there's no budget for you um, for these kinds of activities. Uh, moreover, um, it's just in recent weeks that that we've been doing the math, and and it looks like uh, for impoverished uh, or low resource school districts in North Carolina, um, with this new prioritization from EPA, it appears that. Uh, Districts could get into electric school buses without uh, any investment from the local school district. It may require an outright purchase with rebate, uh, return of all the funds on the tail end, but with the new IRA tax credit, uh, which is um, called the elective pay tax credit, it's available for tax exempt entities such as school districts or counties or, or local governments. And so a school district could conceivably come out ahead 
with additional funding in light of that IRA elective payment, uh, which could be very helpful to the significant amount of work that it has been on each of you, Donnie, Paul, Hope, Wendy, in terms of your administrative oversight, uh, the training you've had to put your folks through, and lots and lots of other uh, 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 payments of time that you've had to make, investments of time. Uh, Hope, would you also remind us of your, your various funding sources? We've got all of ours through the EPA grants that have been available. Um, I will say that um, by the time you factor in infrastructure costs and any extras that you want to add to your bus, cameras, GPS systems, tablets, anything like that, it ended up costing us about $30,000 per bus for, um, for adding those items on. Um, but I would like to, to echo the check with your state's Clean Cities program. They're a great resource. There's also another group called Generation 180. They're fabulous as well for connecting you with the right folks and um, pointing you in the right direction for funding sources. And when do you remind me? One thing that I forgot to mention, we do, we did go with Duke Energy. Uh, they had a pilot program for V to G, and they give us money on that. And they done the charging system and infrastructure and everything. So that was one of the programs that we got. And one other one is uh, WRI, World Resource Institute. Uh, they will help you find money and they won't charge you anything, but they are a big help too. Yeah, that WRI is uh, available at um, information, w wri.org. And uh, Rick, I'm glad you mentioned the TCO, the total cost of ownership, because they do have a study that they've published, which is quite good, on the total cost of ownership. I've also seen a study out of NREL and another one uh, out of California. One of the electric utilities out there has published a, just a two-page fact sheet that's, that's quite compelling on the reduced cost of uh, operation and uh, the improved economics. Uh, Wendy, please remind us of, of the deal that, that got you that first bus. Um, ours was with the VW money. That's what bought the bus. And uh, the Randolph Electric Co-op uh, put in the charger for us. I bought two bags of rocks. That's it. There you Thank go. You. <clears throat> so looking ahead, uh, how do you think electric buses will continue to evolve? And what would you like to see from manufacturers in terms of support or innovation? Um, primarily larger battery capacity. Um, the ability to not have to charge multiple times a day. Um, hopefully being able to charge maybe once a week or every other day, I think will, will be great. Um, faster charging. Uh, and and more of an ability, even though some people have the telematics, but more of an ability for us to be, to, as a school district, be able to manage our charging, whether it's switching it from one bus to another bus, seeing when we have an issue, being able to reset uh, our chargers and then things of the nature. So I think those are the things that are really going to support um, us having a more functional and easier to run um, system and it just makes things easy I mean you want to be able to have the buses and not have to think about them and I think those are the things that that we definitely want to look at I think there needs to be more uh, training on the mechanic side um, bring it down a notch so that they don't have to have an engineering degree to be able to figure out how to work on these buses. Um, because a lot of the school systems, you know, we have our own mechanics. And in the state of North Carolina, we are required to keep buses for 20 years. So we're going to have mixed fleets for a while. Um, and so we've got to be able to jump back and forth. And, and I think that's one of the off-putting things right now is if it breaks, hopefully you've got somebody near that can help you. Um, and that that's a little that's scary to systems right now that i mean it scares us a little bit i'll be honest i keep a diesel bus down there where that electric one is so if that one goes down 
if that thing so much as flickers a light on, we put them put them on a sub bus because we don't understand it yet. We don't we aren't comfortable yet. Um, and I think Thomas bus ours is a Thomas built Julie, and uh, they are fantastic. And maybe it's just a time thing. Maybe we just need to spend time on this. But your community colleges that are educating these kids that go out to be diesel mechanics. I mean, we need to start doing a little bit more with heavy duty electric engines, not just the cars, but the big stuff. Um, that there's a, to me, there's a gap there. Um, but like Donnie said, these things, you could get killed working on these things. Um, and we, we need to, that's an area that we're concerned about. Oh, yeah. Now, well, I'll tell you the community college and the system is working on it. You will, they're in the works how to, how to train folks to work on electric. So that is coming. You know, the statement on the electric, I mean, all the fuels, you know, they're, they all have the idiosyncrasies and they're different. You need to know what you're working on and how to handle it properly for safety. Um, you know, we all have, we all deal with in our homes. We deal with electric, we deal with natural gas, we deal with propane. We also have those as options in transportation. And for the mechanics, and for first responders, the how do you handle those vehicles are different. You have to know what you're dealing with, and you have to know, you know, how to handle it. Uh, same thing in your garage. You know, natural gas rises, propane and and diesel and gasoline go to the floor. So you gotta you gotta be careful of your ignition sources in your in your garages. So they are different. And you know, we're back to education. Education and training is extremely important. Oh, what are your thoughts on evolution? Um, I, same thing that Paul was saying um, with extended battery life. Um, I'm curious, just because it's such a new technology in general, um, what we're going to learn over the next decade. I'm, I'm excited to, to see what comes out of it, um, to see where we can go with this, how we can improve it, how we can make it more affordable. Um, because I know for us, $400,000 bus is, that's a lot. <laughs> so um, affordability, uh, longevity are two things that I, I'm curious about. I'd like to see what evolves. Mm -hmm. I hope I, I like that statement. I get them out there and see what we can learn. And that's been what I try and preach to people. The technology works, but let's put it where it does work so we can get it out there in the field. We can run all kinds of simulations around closed tracks. When you get out in reality, things are very, very different. And we're gonna learn some things. We're gonna to, to get to the next iteration. We're gonna find our shortcomings and we're gonna make things better. So put them out where they work and let's see what we learn. Yeah. Donnie, uh, what are your thoughts about evolution? It, uh, well, just like everybody's saying, longer battery. Um, one of the main things that I think is the charging infrastructure um, get it up and better and get more chargers out there um, these buses will only charge on a dc fast charge uh, you cannot do a level two uh, just get the dc fast chargers out there and what i've seen is even with the charging infrastructure they're still learning too and getting everything going so once they get out there and everybody learns it, it's, it's getting better every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a, a helpful point. Another point that I'll share that uh, we have heard from, from the organization World Resources Institute, WRI.org, is the suggestion that especially for those rural fleets, uh, farther away from the major population centers, it really would be beneficial if these buses could uh, take both a level two charge and a dc fast charge some of the makes and models do uh in north carolina none of the ones available on state contract do have level two charging is my understanding and the the benefit to having that additional capability would be that if one of your dc fast chargers went offline it's probably going to be pretty hard for a local electrician to fix or repair that device but a level two charger can be unplugged and re reconnected very quickly by a licensed electrician. So that uh, resiliency of having capability of level two charging for all the buses is 
I think an admirable goal. What? Rick, did you have a question? Well, I was going to say, you talked that some of the other manufacturers are level two, and that's what we've seen with other school districts we've dealt with across the country. I mean, some, they they feel they need to do DC fast charges. I've had others say, hey, you know, we level two works perfectly fine for us, for our routes and our dwell times. And that's something you need to consider depending, you know, who you are and how you use your vehicles. We see that whether it's a school bus, or whether it's a light duty fleet or a medium duty, you know, different type of vocation. Um, you need to understand how you use your vehicle, what your power requirements are, you know, to do your job and then what you need to do based on your dwell time to get back to level energy you need to go out and do your, your job again. So there, not every school bus is gonna need DC fast. Um, however, you need to have that option as, as, as a charging option on your vehicle. Because there's a significant price difference between a level two and a DC fast, and then depending on what DC fast you use, your your you know how fast you want to do it, that price you know all of this costs money. More batteries cost money, higher charging rates cost money, and you don't want to build the Taj Mahal and price yourself out of the game. We talk about sustainability. There also has to be fiscal sustainability. Um, it has to work. I mean, if we're forced to pay for our buses on our own and we can only afford you know, a quarter of what we're doing today, can we do it with 25% of what we're doing today? The answer is no. So you know, we need to, need to do this in a measured, you know, calculated way. Yeah, thank you. So for the next uh, set of questions, I'd like to do the round robin on peer advice. So for rural fleet managers especially, who might be skeptical about electric buses. What advice or insights can you share based on your own experiences, Donnie? Uh, I guess one of the main things is you order your bus, it's coming. Um, that's a done deal. Uh, one of the main things to me is uh, your charging infrastructure. When you get started, uh, have teams meeting with all the people involved and get everybody on the same what same wavelength and get it done um that's what really helped us here is when we was installing our chargers uh everybody was knew what each one was doing and that got the job done a whole lot cleaner and better yeah so having those uh those team meetings early and often Yes, we had a team meeting once a week, and that got everybody, even the people installing it, the designers, everybody that was involved. And that was a big help to me because I knew what everybody was doing and what was happening when I got a question asked me. Yeah. And I remember you got those started even before the buses were ordered. Right. And and you did them virtually. You you just used uh, video conferencing, right? Right. Um, let's go to Wendy next. Thoughts about what advice you would give to your peers? I I agree with Donnie. I think you got to get everybody on the same page. Um, I think that you know you really need to think through the logistics of it. Like I said, where are you going to park it? How are you going to charge it? Who's going to plug it in? Um, is there a cover over it? Is there not a cover over it? Uh, what do you do when the power goes down at two o'clock in the morning and it's not charged? What are you gonna do? Um, you, you have a quick early release day that you're not planning for um, and the bus hasn't been able to charge yet. Are you okay? Um, those kinds of things. I think you just really need to think through the logistics of it. Um, we did a lot of training outside of the garage with our first responders and the majority of the firemen in Randolph County are, are volunteer firemen. So Thomas came down and they did a really, really good training program with them, brought the bus in, put the bus up on lift, uh, let them come in, ask questions, crawl all over it, see it. Um, you really need to do that with your community as well. Just, we spent some time, we took, we're the home of the North Carolina Zoo. So we took it down to the zoo on electric days and um, just kind of get it out there. Just know your people and know what you need to do. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And Hope, uh, your your district is not strictly rural, but but you're a smaller district. So what what advice would you share with your peers? I would say utilize grant funding as much as possible. Um, so that way you have you can bring this technology in and then work on buy-in. If you're struggling with buy-in, bring them in, and then like I said, once the driver drives it, they love it. So um, just showing them, having that show and tell. Um, and take your time with your first one. Um, you don't have to put it out on the road right away. Take your time, make sure your mechanics are comfortable first, and then make sure that your supervisors or any of your management team know how to assist should something go wrong, and then train all your drivers. Take your time with it. You don't have to put it out on the road day one. Um, and understand it's probably gonna take longer than you think it's going to with the whole process. Um, from you know, getting easement rights for installing utilities to um, infrastructure to getting everybody trained. Um, the quickest part for us was receiving the bus. <laughs> that, was, that was the fastest. Um, everything else takes time and, and take your time with it. Make sure you're you're comfortable before you before you go full force. Mm -hmm. Paul, how do you respond to folks who are skeptical but in the fleet management or transportation? director status so the first thing you want to do and there's, there's a couple of fronts but the, one of the first things you want to make sure that you have funding you know every school's district they have budgetary constraints you know they're short staffed and and you know you want to make sure that you're able to find the money that you need and you don't have to hire a grant specialist you know as we kind of spoke to before earlier on uh, on the panel, you know, we have groups that's available to help us, you know, like WRI, World Resources Institute, Generation 180, uh, Clean Cities. Our vendors um, are very helpful with uh, even with applying for grants and supporting us through the whole process. And our utility companies, I think those are the people that you want to build that team to look for the funding. And of course, echoing a lot of things everybody else said, but one thing a little bit different when it comes down to getting buy-in from our drivers, if you could identify one person that, or one driver that loves it and is going to be able to talk its, its greatness, you know, from a driver perspective, that's how you're going to sell your whole team. You know, we were lucky to have one driver that, that really was an advocate earlier on. He got on the electric bus. We actually took the electric bus to different teams to say, hey, this is what the bus is. And that breaks down some of that stigma of, oh my God, this is coming. And I don't want to touch it because it's new. You know, so we brought it to them and, and we really kind of spoke to it. And I think that's what got a lot of the buy-in from the drivers. So I would say, identify your funding, take your time. You know, you want to be on the cutting edge, but not the bleeding edge of this technology. So take your time with it. They have a very detailed and smart way to kind of go through your process. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> we're we're just past the hour, uh, and I don't see any questions that have been typed in by our participants or attendees. Oh, um, John, we have questions. Yeah. Oh, have excuse questions. me. I'm not not seeing them. This handful. Um, are you looking at the chat or the quite pop out the question page? Oh, sure enough, there they are. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. I'll just go through them. Okay, good. What are the brand names of your electric buses that you operate and what was your purchasing formula? Is it by calling for a tender? Uh, I suppose that means requests for proposals or bids. Or did you do it jointly with a manufacturer or a local dealership? Uh, Donnie? No, ours was just, we'd done it with Thomas uh, buses. And uh, we've got six of them. Okay. And um, Wendy? All built bus because they're built in Randolph County, North Carolina. <laughs> Uh, Paul. <laughs> Sorry, Paul? No, I was saying that's a home team uh, advantage, right? <laughs> Randolph Electric, Randolph County Schools, and Thomas built bus in Randolph County. Yep. Okay. Sure was. 
You, th <laughs> you didn't want to have a revolt. You thought they were, they were upset over electric bus. If it was an electric bus that wasn't Thomas built, they'd be in big trouble. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> and Paul, what what are your brands? And and did you put out bids or? No, same thing. We 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 purchased off of the state contract with Thomas Buses. Um, the initial eight that we received was through was through Dominion, and they had a partnership with Thomas, and we just continued on with um, familiarity and had everything working. And hope. We're also Thomas Built too. Um, Thomas Built Julie's and uh, like Paul, we purchased off the state contract. We partnered with Sunny Merriman our state dealer and they um facilitated everything on our behalf okay i want to emphasize for our viewers that this was an unintentional uh happenstance of of creating a panelist of only uh owners of thomas built buses friends but sure. um <clears throat> let's see uh has anyone uh any experience comparing propane powered buses with electric or, or, or cng for that matter have you guys looked at any alternative fuels other than diesel and now electric no getting a bench getting a bunch of no's okay oh but donnie you could speak to the biodiesel question that's an yeah, old I, don't, I don't really see any difference in fuel mileage and stuff like that with the it's no different uh using bio um versus electric i mean it, there's no difference i mean with fuel consumption versus diesel right yeah. but um yeah we kind of touched on on you know charging strategy i mean you guys are planning on um expanding your fleets at least three of the four folks are and you know what are you doing in terms of future proofing and, and planning to meet the needs of of more electric fleet? Um, for us here in Lynchburg, we went ahead and um, did the underground work for our infrastructure uh, while we were at it the first go round. Um, so we're prepped for uh, eight more. So our next eight, mm -hmm. everything's prepped. We just have to pour the um, pour the concrete and install the charger. We basically done the same thing too. When we first designed it, uh, it is designed for the full fleet. Okay. And then I think I think Paul, you said you have vehicles all over the place, and you're looking when you do facility upgrades to to add in charging capabilities and. Right. That's correct. Um, just just future planning for uh, capital improvement plans, renovations. Um, our existing uh, garages or our yards. I'm just looking to see when we could expand on it, and uh, it's kind of working from there. With our white fleet, we took the similar kind of uh, plan where we trenched out more more than we needed. So all we kind of have to do is drop the charges on it when when they're ready. So we're looking at all different options. No, that, and that that's the best practice we see, whether it's a school bus or not, is you need to anticipate the future. You, you, and when you're, you're, your biggest thing is getting the power there, trenching, et cetera, is, is one of your biggest costs. So if you you got the ground open, put the conduit in, the biggest one for the biggest wire you're gonna pull, uh, mm -hmm. and be ready for the future instead of busting up concrete and digging. That's not a smart way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, like your utilities, Duke Energy was a big help with us. Yeah. Uh, installing the uh, transformers and everything, it was, you can't right. beat what they've done for us. Yeah, and that's that's one of the best practices we talk about when electrification is bring your utility in as early as possible. Have discussion with them, see what the capabilities are, see what you may need for upgrades and what their plans are. They they may say, hey, you may want to choose a different site based on on what their future plans are, what the capabilities are, um, and we've seen that we've seen people place their charges in different locations. Than they originally planned on at, at, at certain facilities or, or campuses. Yeah, and I'd like to give a shout out to the Cooperative Electric Utilities. Uh, see a couple who are present in the audience and uh, the Municipal Electric Utilities as well. Um, all of the utilities really uh, 
are eager to be partners in these projects and so if you haven't reached out to them but you even have the slightest idea that you would like to uh, pursue this path uh, we strongly encourage that you get in, in touch with them sooner than later okay. and there's a question i'm going to rephrase it a little differently um the other components on the bus and you know donnie you mentioned brakes are they different than your conventional fuel buses um you know, one eye comes to my mouth. So it's uh, just, the same, it's disc brakes all the way around. Right, same, same basically the same system? Basically same system. Right. Our compressor is a little different. Right. What is, is there a weight difference with battery electric motor versus you know, diesel powertrain? Well, I've not really looked at the difference between the two. I know the battery weighs 3,500 pounds. I recall looking at the specs, and I do believe that the Julie is a bit heavier than the uh, diesel, conventional diesel. And the weight distribution is different as well, because all your weights on the bottom of the bus of an electric. Yeah, that's you know with with the light duty that that's a, a ride and handling uh, performance improvement. Mm -hmm. um, should be with the buses as well. You know, just a lower CG down 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 near your axles. I know one one thing that a lot of our drivers like is uh, takeoff where you're pulling out, you're getting in the road, you can take off a whole lot faster than a diesel bus. Yeah, that's what I was going to say to Randolph County. You need to do a drag race between a diesel bus and your electric bus. <laughs> we did. Yeah, my boys that. <laughs> <laughs> we actually but, um, done that. No. But, um, Here's one. I, I I'm curious. Um, what is what are your the the schools that are out there? Your opinion on a refurbished or conversion of a existing diesel bus to electric? So you take it take a bus maybe you were you were older and have it refurbed all the way around and have it converted to an electric drivetrain. It, would that be a, a consideration? I know our DPI is not that's not their first choice. Um, financially, that there's some folks out there that are doing it, and it's a whole lot cheaper than buying an electric bus. I would be skeptical about it. Mm -hmm. No, nope. um, what's that, Donnie? Skeptical. I'm skeptical about doing that. Um, I have had them come by and try to sell me some, but I'm not. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it new. And I think that's that's a position a DPI here in North Carolina. Uh, they're concerned just age, you know, frame suspension, safety, et cetera. Yeah, and, and reliability. And you know, once you start modifying buses, and do you still keep them in spec? What's the reliability? What's your warranty? You know, so those are all things to consider, especially you know, transporting students. You don't want to be the one that goes out there and ends up you know, in the news. Okay, just a conservative approach. Right. Uh, yes, we did have a question. Oh, sorry, Rick. Uh, well, we did have a question about uh, the length of routes, and a couple of you have mentioned this in passing, but could we do a round robin on the routes that you have currently EVs deployed on? The length of route? Donnie? Our longest route, like I said a while ago, it's 55 miles round trip. Uh, and we're coming back with probably 70% on our battery on that route. Uh, they can do it on one charge, both routes. Um, and most of them are running around a 20, 25 mile round trip. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of seasonality, have you seen uh, some degradation in, in warm warm temperature as well as cold? We we see that in the light duty market. We, uh, you do use a lot more battery power in the winter to make heat. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a difference. It takes a lot more to make heat than it does AC. Right. 
and the batteries like to be around 71 degrees. It just seems to, they like San Diego weather. So mm -hmm. you, you're using additional energy to heat the batteries also. Right, right. right. And there's a chiller on the bus that keeps the battery at 71. Right. The battery nice. are better. Yep. Next, other folks in terms of your your route lengths and and how it's how it's working. I think somebody said they do they do charge to, um, during the, they have they have to charge in between trips. Mm -hmm. We're we're looking at about 90 to 100 miles round trip for for AM and PM belt. All right. We're about the same. We're about 90 miles round trip or full day mm -hmm. um, for our route. Right. And we're that 90. 90 miles. I'm sorry. We're about 90 miles uh, one trip or round trip for one you know, a.m. So we charge in between. Yeah. How, how does that work with your, your power company? I know certain areas, you know, have demand chargers time of use what how are you able you okay with that some of them have flat rate which which is great if you have that because we had a problem uh, here in a we, county with with some transit buses that came home at lunch to to have lunch because they needed it and uh, they got a pretty significant demand charge which was a very big surprise oh we're good so you guys are probably flat rate Mm -hmm. You know, I'll be honest with you. I have no idea. I just plug it in because it's got to go. <laughs> I know on your software, uh, uh, if you have the software, you can set the charge to discharge only at night or whatever. Right. Yeah. I know how in the evening they do that. In the evening, they bump me over to the better time. Uh, but during the day, it's not really optional. I got to have, have it. You have a choice. Yep. So the next question, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read it verbatim because it's pretty pretty sharp. Uh, our bus garage will need a major service upgrade to accommodate EV charging. We've started initial discussions with our utility, but it's not clear, clear where the funding will come from to upgrade the utility lines. Have any of the panelists had to deal with this? Our garage won't even fit a 77 passenger, but we're making do. We can only put half the bus in the garage at a time, but uh, we're just grinning and bearing it until we can do a major facility overhaul, which I, it's not on the books anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Same here. I think we have to have a larger percentage of of our vehicle fleet in order to really kind of push the envelope to say, you know, go to the county because the county is the one that does uh, our servicing and say, hey, we need we need more. You know, where with the our char our garages don't even have chargers, so we have to make sure we're fully charged before we send them down there for for just our regular routine PMIs. Mm. Now, Don, you all have a shop charger. Yes, uh, we do have a charger that it's a. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. I can't think of the name of it at the time, but uh, we can plug it into uh, 220 and do a DC fast charge. And we made it mobile where we could roll it in the shop, roll it around and plug it up on any of our 220 plugs. And you have also been grappling with the issue of limited electrical supply at that site. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, we're trying, I'm trying to make it mobile where we can put it on the truck and if something happens, we can go out and charge the bus while we got it out on the road. Um, trying to figure out how I'm going to do it, but we will see. Yeah. <clears throat> and about the, uh, interactions that you've had with Duke, uh, in light of, the ambitious plans to go with the full fleet conversion. You've been actually looking at the transformers and a long-term plan for utility upgrades. And tell us a little bit more about that. Like, like, why would you even consider a microgrid? Well, in the microgrid, we can uh, hook it up to the company. 
uh, help the company with power. Um, we have a, quite a few buildings around here we can do solar with, and you can tie the microgrid to that. And with our solar canopy to go over the buses and all that, we could hopefully go to net zero one day. Is, is anybody else looking at off-grid solutions or some type of storage that you could either use, you know, for resiliency and or, you know, peak shaving um, to benef benefit your your cost of your electricity? More for resiliency. Um, I think one of the things with having that microgrid, you'll be able to have like a continuing operations plan where if you did lose power in the school or you needed to have a heating and cooling centers, we're able to support the schools in that, that manner. Um, nothing at this point for cost shavings because since we partner with Dominion Energy, that's their kind of thought process. They kind of own the batteries. So they're saying, hey, we want the batteries for that purpose. So even after the end of our life, which is 15 years for us, they plan on keeping the batteries for additional redundancies, but the same, under the same token, once we purchase vehicles on our own, we have to start thinking of what are we going to do once the our useful of the bus is gone, what are we going to do with the batteries? Are we going to use that for redundancy, cost shavings, you know, just being able to store energy? So those are all things like further down the line, I think that you have to kind of think through. Yeah, and one like the microgrid we were talking about, uh, where we're located, we can tie our fire department and ambulance service to that buildings to maybe help them when they don't have power. Uh, just stuff like that that can help. That's an important point, Donnie. And I think because there may be some who listen to this webinar who have a similar situation where either the school is an emergency shelter or there may be first responder facilities nearby or immediately adjacent. Uh, it, it is worth emphasizing that uh, the resiliency effect of having school buses that can deliver energy back into a building or back into the grid, that's really worth looking at. Another piece of this is uh, having that microgrid uh, situation that, that both Donnie and Paul have described uh, gives you that strength of being able to continue operations in a critical situation after disaster or power complete power failure. Um, there are FEMA grants available for that, for those who are listening. It would be, uh, you'd look into the BRIC, B-R-I-C, Building Resiliency in Communities. And that's, that's definitely worth mentioning. Yeah, that's one thing you can remember. You, you have a mobile power plant and you can take it to a building that's ready to be hooked up and you can hook it up and run that building for a little while. Yeah, yeah. good. All right, well, um, I think we've gotten through all the questions. There were some comments, um, but rather than diving into those, I think I'll, I'll ask, are there closing thoughts from uh, folks on the, on the panel? Any final thoughts or words of wisdom you'd like to share with fellow fleet managers considering this transition? The only thing with me, like I said in the beginning, is uh, the main thing is your infrastructure. Uh, think about it, get it in the right place, um, and have your teams meet to keep everybody on the same wavelength. That's the main thing with me. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, take a measures approach. Um, get past the initial skepticism and, and, and being lost at sometimes and really utilize your resources around you to get everything that you need and take a measured approach at it. And this, this is not something that's impossible. You guys can do it. It's been done and there's help all along the way. For anybody that is, is unsure or has questions, come on over. Give me a call. Come to our facility. Um, ride on our bus. Drive our bus. Um, realize you're not alone. 
we're, we're all reaching out to one another, asking questions. So if you're ever unsure, just reach out to somebody. We'd be more than happy to help, to share our experience, to show you what we've done. Um, so come on over. Happy to show you around. That's beautiful. Thank you, Hope. Same with me. Yeah. Come see us. Come see us. I think it's worth it. I think you just need to do it as a team. Um, and don't be upset if, if somebody doesn't agree with you. Um, just kind of take it slow and, and the bus will sell itself. Absolutely. Great. Wonderful. Well, friends, thank you all so much for your time today. We really appreciate your expertise and your sharing your experience with the public. And um, I'll put in a final plug for the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center here in North Carolina specifically. Uh, we are funded through grant work to to uh, provide a measure of technical assistance to those of you who are in need. If you have questions, if you are seeking grants, please feel free to reach out to us. Rick, thank you for being the MC, and thank you again, panelists. Hope everybody I was glad has to be part of this. Yeah, thank you. We really appreciate the expertise and and uh, time you put in here. And yeah. good point. You know, we're all here to help. Um, I love the 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 Let's say the municipal fleet folks, everybody's willing to help. So the doors open. I call fleet managers all over the country every day asking for help. And they, they usually help me out. So ask for it if you need it. All right, John, I think we're good. Good day, all. Thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you all.